Right guys, welcome back to the Adventure Athletes podcast. We've got a great episode for you today with Kerry Husk from Husky Sports Therapy. Um, she's based in Barry in the Vale of Glamorgan, um, that's South Wales. So if you have any treatment needs, check her out. Her Instagram is Husky Sports Therapy. Um, in this episode, we're going to be talking about overuse injuries, um, prehab, especially for those that are less active, looking to become more active and how to build up to that. It might be taking on something from your first 5k to building from a 10k to a marathon. Um, those are just running examples. It could be swimming. It could be doing your first adventure athlete sort of challenge like me and Taylor do. Whatever it is, this information is going to be crucial for you. So it's definitely worth the listen. Um, we're also going to be talking through the mechanisms for pain and how our body responds to pain and you'll get some information that you might not know about so this again is definitely worth the listen and then throughout the episode we progress on to talking martial arts because Kerry is a black belt in two different styles of karate um, so then we start delving into the world of martial arts and the culture around it. So for those that are new, um, me and Taylor run the podcast. We both do adventure challenges. Recently, I've walked 50 miles barefoot. I'm getting ready to do the Welsh 3000s next. And Taylor has flipped tire at Penavan. He's done a hammerthon consisting of 28,000 hits of a sledgehammer to a tire, um, as well as he carried a yoke, 60 kilos, I believe for a half marathon um, so that's a bit of a background to us and then Kerry is like I said she's a sports therapist she deals with injury rehabilitation returning to sport and then just any general sort of thing you can think of um, from injury prevention to sports performance and massage definitely someone to check out and let's get into the episode welcome to the adventure athletes podcast and we're back. Welcome back to the next episode of the Adventure Athletes Podcast. A podcast. Oh, Jesus, it's been a long one. <laughs> Today we are joined by Kerry, who is uh, one of the best physios in Wales, I would argue. And uh, <laughs> not being biased at all because you're my physio. And you've also now become Wales physio as well. So you've looked after our broken bodies for the stupid stuff we've done. You're incredibly knowledgeable about uh, physio and can really think of yourself on um, your feet in terms of the practice instead of just sticking to the rule book. You know how to uh, deal with these bizarre scenarios. You're also quite the martial artist as well. So, tell us a little bit about yourselves, if I have not done you enough credit there. <laughs> I feel like I've just come here to be complimented, I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> yeah, it's you pretty can leave much, though, yeah, I've done, yeah, that's, I've it. Done, that's <laughs> it. Don't spoil it. Pretty much as you said, Taylor, so I'm a sports therapist, I work with people who have either injuries, acute or chronic, I specialise in, chron in chronic conditions because that's where I've got my kind of experience from. Yeah. Um, and yeah, martial arts is another massive part of my life. That's pretty much it. I must sound really boring. Just injuries and martial arts. They go together really well though. <laughs> they do. So I injure people and then I give them my business card. I like, like that. That's a really go. good business card. That's kind of what <laughs> I do. Perfect. I injure people in uh, in Broward and Barry and then I just sneak a card over to them. It works for me. It does. <laughs> Right, let, we'll start off with uh, physio and then we'll kind of get into karate later because they're, they're two very, um, obviously they're, they're very intertwined, the tops can be, but I think it'd be good if we talk on physio first and then we'll move into um, the karate section later and there's some philosophy stuff I want to pick your brain on mm -hmm. there as well. So, first things first, we had Dion on last episode, which was actually the day before yesterday, the uh, True North Project. And no, the question, it was yesterday. Yes, it was before yesterday. yesterday. And it's just been a long week. <laughs> I've spaced out at the moment. So, Dion's question for you was, what is the most common injury and why do you think it occurs so frequently? Ooh. So the most common complaint I get coming through to, to me, and I think it's the same across the board, 
is chronic back pain. Yeah. It's not necessarily an injury. Sometimes there's an injury that's kicking it off. Yeah. But often it's just kind of something that creeps up on people. And it's so common, especially in, in our Western society. Um, we get a lot of desk workers. They develop chronic pain in their back. They do certain movements. It causes them pain. They start avoiding those movements that are going to actually strengthen their back and help them get get past it and then it kind of just spirals from there so that's probably the most common thing that I see I think the reason why most people kind of fret about their chronic back pain is because it's our spine and we kind of get brought up and we get told yeah your brain and your spine they're pretty important we should keep them safe yeah so as soon as there's something injury wise that's thinking head or spine we're like oh crap that's yeah. that's not good or neck yeah, we're obviously part of the spine there <laughs> yeah well i include that but yeah. yeah do you um so it's quite interesting that you said particularly in western society so what particularly about the way we live in the more westernized world makes us a bit more prone to chronic back conditions versus the east you've gone already um so i say that because i base it on the studies that i read which are predominantly done in sort of western countries just because that's how where i'm reading them from in in our native language yeah but i do think that there's an element of modern society maybe that's a better way of saying it yeah. that's so much more sedentary than what we're naturally designed to do there's a reason why our body moves and it's not so that we can sit at a desk like this all day just Pushing just yeah chest. shrugging not moving movement is what helps our joints to stay healthy it's what helps our muscles to stay strong and and without it we're just ugh. You're telling me movement is the cure, not an expensive I'm, supplement on Instagram. I'm is trendy. telling you, movement is the best thing you can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can sum up the podcast there. Just yeah, move, yeah, move yeah, everyone. Yeah. Simple. Be an adventure athlete, right? And Step most one. things, <laughs> <laughs> most things will be fine. Yeah, but then you go too far the other way. That's then going too far the other way. Yeah, you guys like to push it. <laughs> so that will actually bring me on one of the points I've got written down here, and I think we'll get this one out of the way early because um, of your kind of um, relation with treat me and Will is a bit more, I suppose, niche what we do, mm. and then we get into more kind of general public. So I've been working with you since I started doing, it was just after the Hamathon, I think. Yeah. yeah. So that's when I first started working with you, and I had that trapped bundle of fibers in my left trap so for those who don't know the trap is a muscle on the uh, sort of top of the shoulder going into your neck and down the back it's a bit of like an upside down l shape where they meet and i had this sensation whenever i did um power cleans uh particularly when i was putting the bar back down so it's sort of olympic lifting uh, any sort of heavy or fast kettlebell swing but also if i was in a plank position i was reaching I started to get this electric shock sensation in my uh, left trap. And even though everyone's like, all right, nerve damage, you're dead, you're done. And I came to you and it was just like, a, it was a tiny bundle of fibers that just kept getting trapped over and over. Is that something that's like quite common? Uh, or do you think because of the stupid nature of what we do, <laughs> that we get things a little bit more bespoke in Drew Rise? So I think that because especially if we look at your hammerthon, it was repetitive movement, one single repetitive movement all day and for months beforehand that you were training. Yeah. So you were using those muscles in one way and you adapted to use those muscles in one way. So when then you kind of you eased off your training for your hammerthon and started to look more at regaining some mobility through your shoulder instead of just like that crazy strength through the front of your shoulder to stabilize the movement you were going through that's when things kind of go actually we've not done this for a little while and we're not as strong as we want to be um, I get a lot of people come in and they get nerve pain so that kind of like shooting sharp sensation or burning that's what you'd kind of yeah. classically think yeah that's something nerve related and often when you tell people, if we're looking gen pop now, you say, oh, there might be some nerve involvement, maybe we'll check and we'll just double check and see. People immediately go like, oh no, nerves, that's the end of the world. But a lot of the time, the sensations we're getting is compression on the nerves rather than injury to the nerve itself. And that's what you had going on is there was compression in that nerve, which is, is what was causing you that pain. 
but a little bit of movement, a little bit of release, a lot of the mobility work that you were doing is what helps to release that pressure off and get you to a point where that's not bothering you anymore, I should hope. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, no, I'll just move on to other injuries instead. Yeah, yeah, just collect them like a stamp card at Costa or something. So, so me, the kind of injuries I've been through, at least in my own experience with doing the uh, any of the challenges, is because it's months of training and the event itself is then like this sort of just stress the max then, but just in one day, it feels very similar to sort of manual laborers mm. kind of injuries, where it's just months of repetitive conditioning to do one bespoke kind of movement pattern or a series of movement patterns and that eventually leads to some some sort of just um build up or rather um overuse injury That's yeah what it was close to an rsi so a repetitive strain injury or an overuse yeah. injury and that's it's common in people that do the same movement time after time like a really classic one is wrist when you're just on the computer all day every yeah. day um, the more diversified the training, the less likely that I'm going to be looking at someone who's got an overuse injury, unless they're training all day, every day. But then for a lot of your challenges, it's one movement. And it's that one movement that you want to push to the max. You had the hammer thorn, you had flipping the tyre up, up Penavan, you had the yoke marathon that, that you were looking at. That was the worst one. Yeah. That was such a stupid idea. <laughs> I've forgotten where we were going now. So, there was a point. <laughs> yeah, we talked about the, the pets who said yeah. the pets strain injury. So, months conditioning, mm. recent injury. Um, I suppose, uh, off of that then, for more the general public question, is if you are doing a sport and you very much gear your training around the sport, What's something you can do to offset getting a repetitive strain? So you're a runner or you're a swimmer, because I have a couple of um, people at Brown actually swim mm -hmm. quite a lot because we're down in Barry, and they get a lot of shoulder injuries. Yeah. What can they do to offset that? So it's all about <clears throat> progressive overload, which everyone yes. will say. Anything that you're doing movement-wise will require strength to support the joints that you're moving, the action that you're doing. And if you go from zero to 100 real quick, you're going to get injured. Yeah. The body gets injured when you ask it to do something it's not strong enough or mobile enough to handle. So if you go from, I'm a recreational swimmer, maybe I've done it once a week up until recently, but now that's going to be my only exercise. I'm going to do it three or four times a week you are going to be doing repetitive movements that is going to be putting strain, putting pressure on the joints, particularly the shoulders, because you've got to have quite good mobility and good strength. Yeah. That's when you're more likely to get that injury is when the workload you're asking your body to do exceeds what it's able to do. So what you want to do is look at re really being really gradual and the more gradual, the better in my mind. If you start to feel like you're, you're getting that, pain and you think that it is because of a repetitive movement you're doing take it back to its basics look at what muscles are involved in that movement look at building strength in those muscles building mobility in those joints and using that as a way to kind of help whatever sport it is that you're doing that's having that repetitive aching pain injury impact would you say people do in those sports can get to that level of doing these extreme things like me and Taylor without doing anything else other than their sport, if that makes sense. So like for me, I did my 50 mile mm -hmm. walk. Do you think they could get to that point just by walking and just being a bit more sensible with the progressions? Or do you think they need to do other stuff as well? I think it depends on your, your mentality. I think that anybody could, but it's, it's how far are you willing to push yourself where you're past where you're comfortable and then into where you're going to be uncomfortable because 50 mile barefoot walk it's not going to be comfortable even for yourself when you trained it and I think that there are definitely some people out there who could literally go no nah, I'm just gonna knuckle down and do it and they'll get through it and it might suck but they've got the mentality to do it I think that everybody could but most people would need it broken down they would need something extra to help them either recover build the strength that they need or even just support the mentality that they would need to get into to do a challenge like that because it's not easy to access that kind of mindset. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so based off of that then, <clears throat> uh, I've got a lot of 
of physio topics written down here. <laughs> so it feels like my exams now when I was back in uni. Right, oh, we're no. gonna quiz you on hamstring tendinopathy. Go, no. no I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so uh, we've gone over the injuries that me and kind of will have come across. Um, so something I want to ask you about then is preventative training mm -hmm. or what's kind of been labeled prehab, uh, yeah, prehab and bulletproof training these days. So as you said, a very good way to prevent uh, getting well, to you know proceed any sort of challenge is to not step outside your optimal level of training. Mm -hmm. So to follow um, the law of progressive overload. But what about prehab? Because obviously you said about identifying the movement patterns and the muscles that activate in the range of motion for any given sport is key to understand when you start getting into it. But obviously there's some stuff I've done and Will's done. There's not literature on this. There's not like how do you walk 20 miles with the oak? Um, how does that break your mm. body down? So I came to you quite often and we kind of figured out what was happening with the body and from there could piece together actual movements and preventative uh, styles of training or what they call them um, uh, like in just injury prevention prehab yeah. so how does that fit in for someone's say for example a swimmer again they they've just started swimming again maybe they had an injury years ago or they've just gone out in the sport after a break maybe they're kids so they took a break and they do one session a week and now they're like right i'm gonna do swim four times a week mm. how would they go about looking at injury prevention training where does it fit into a training regime so i mean first off you can't prevent all injuries it's, yeah. it's something that we say injury prevention and you can't prevent if you're an open water swimmer and a random wave hits you it might knock you you might get an injury you can't predict that so you can't prevent everything but you can do your best to offset the yeah. probability of getting an injury and there's so much out there on social media online on google that you could look at and sometimes it's like a double-edged sword it's like there's so much information that this swimmer this hypothetical swimmer could go out and access and start to actually build quite a good program for themselves but then it becomes a case of there's too much information and yeah. the more you look the more you'll find people who have completely different opinions and there is an element of opinion in it even though it's backed by science and i think that it's important to remember that the slower you go the better in general and breaking down the movement either approach a professional who can break down the movement for you or look into the biomechanics of the movement you're doing. So for example, like a breaststroke, Google the biomechanics, have an idea, just see what muscles are working, what actions are they doing, and then find those actions and their equivalent in some form of resistance training or mobility training. The, the information is, is out there. It's just the problem of whether you can kind of piece through as much information as there is for you out there. So if someone was coming to you being like, I've got this stupid idea of a thing I want to do. So you guys, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, or Basically. even just like someone like Taylor was saying, looking to get back into sport or mm -hmm. go to the next level of their sport. If they were like, right, I don't want to get injured. Um, sort of how many exercises would you give them? And where would you fit it into their program? Would it have its own day? It's would it go at the start of session? Well. So it depends on what they're doing at the moment and where they're at. So if I have someone come in in pain, for example, with an injury, I'd never give them more than three prescriptive exercises. And the reason for that is that if something flares their pain, I know exactly what it is. I can break it down. If I give them six, it's going to take us a really long time to kind of get an idea which one is the one that's aggravating that pain and what we can do to get around it. If they're coming at it from a, they're feeling fresh, they're all good, they just want to move more then it depends on what their lifestyle's like, what their training's like, because it has to fit in with your lifestyle. If they're already training three times a week at Broad and they want to start open water swimming, but they're swimming down the leisure centre once a week, I know that they're pretty chocker. So anything I give them has to fit in around that. For the majority of people that come in, they don't want a completely separate programme for a completely different day of the week that they have to put the effort and the time into they want something that fits in with what they've got so i would look at exercises that could be utilized either in their ex existing training or as a warm-up for the moves they want to do or a cool down or something that they can do 
any time but then it depends on the person so you get some people come in and they sit there and they tell you no I want a full program twice a week I'm gonna do it and then you know you can give them a little bit more but you do still need that feedback especially if they're going from baseline zero because if you go too quick too soon and it's different for everybody depending on their strength levels their age in their sport their the history with the sport you can get them to a point where they're feeling quite comfortable to do it quite quickly it can take quite a while you can get them to a point where they think actually i'm just going to push it and go and see and you have to kind of work with a lot of what i do is working with the mentality of the person as well as the physiology of the person and i'd argue probably that's more important is the mentality of who's asking you what they want to get to what their goal is and how you're going to work with them okay and then building on from that if it's specific for a stupid challenge like me and taylor <laughs> um there's a theme yeah and there's sort of there's trends in what we do they're different but there's the same sort of trends it's usually repetitive movement mm -hmm. that people don't want to do and we do it for a long period of time um what would you say like i know this is very generic but what would you say is the generic qualities you need to build to do something like that because obviously the specifics will change for each challenge but like generally what are you looking at they need so generally i'd be looking at physiologically how strong is your body to do that particular thing how much endurance have you built up particularly because your challenges tend to be endurance based where we're at now where we need to get to what is the time frame we've got and how can we sensibly separate that up that's probably it that i'd look at physiologically physiologically that's a long word that's too long of a word for a sunday <laughs> Yes, there'd be specifics in terms of what the actual challenge is, what the movement is, but that's what I'd be mainly worried about. Other than that, it's what's your drive to do it? Why are you doing it and how important is it to you? And if it's important enough, the work will happen. But if it's not important enough, that's when you start to think, oh, are they, are they going to go in a little bit half cooked? Are they going to injure themselves? Am I going to see them in three weeks time and they're hobbling around because they've done something and they weren't ready for it and they didn't have the mentality to get themselves ready for it? That's what happens when the stupid stuff comes into play. Like with you guys, I know that generally your mentality is pretty good for it. There's a good drive. There's a good reason why you do things. Sometimes people come in and they're like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to run three ultra mar marathons in a week. And you go, why? And they go, oh, I just feel like it. And that's when you start to think, well, I mean, it's a good reason feeling like it. But is it because you want to challenge yourself? Are you trying to raise money? Is it something you've always wanted to do? Is it something someone's told you eh, you'd never be able to do that? Is there a reason why? Or is it literally just a whim? And that that I think will do more than any kind of physiological prep we can do, which is important, but not as important as the mindset when it comes to, like you say, the crazy shit. <laughs> so you think keeping the ego in check is quite a big part of it? Definitely, yeah. You need some drive, you need some level of confidence in order to undertake anything like yeah. that. You're never going to do it if you have no confidence, no sense of self. It, you just won't attempt it. But if then, like you say, that ego gets too big and you think, yeah, this is all, this will be fine. That's when you start to think, no, we need to find a nice middle ground. We need to be a little bit disciplined with ourselves, with our own personality, because it's not going to be easy. And I think kind of, kind of the biggest thing you see sometimes is people who expect it to be easy find it isn't easy and yeah. then have that sudden shock. And then they start thinking, actually, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts. I don't want to do this anymore. And then you get in that mental space that's really negative and how you feel affects how you feel. So if you're feeling pretty negative, if you're feeling pretty kind of like, that was a shock to the system, I didn't expect that, you're gonna start feeling what your body's wanting you to feel. It's gonna come out somehow. You're gonna be aching, you're gonna be sore, maybe you're in pain. To the something you said, um, there's, I, I can't remember what I heard about it, there was a, a study where they found that people that smiled when they were doing hit, the school of frowned, actually had a far <laughs> different, like totally differentiate perception of fatigue and people have like new like just use their normal coping mechanisms were like still performing worse but mm. when they told ex 
people in the group to smile, they performed something like twenty percent better, or the rate the rate of exertion was twenty percent less. Yeah. I mean, that's a danger there, I say, and right, you should smile more. You don't feel like you're enjoying this. I think that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not picking on you, I promise. <laughs> you can't be the boy. <laughs> I, am. I think that there's a massive element of, of emotions and how they play in to how you feel physically. I mean, that's, that's pretty much... People know that, people understand that. I think it's quite an interesting study looking at people and making them smile during here. I'm not sure I could smile for a full hit session no. but if you enjoy something and sometimes smiling and laughing and dancing makes you enjoy it even if you're not necessarily feeling it in the moment you're going to feel way, way better about yourself do you think it's almost like trying to change what your body does to try and get your so change the physiology to try and get your psychology to reflect it maybe mm, definitely like, like I think, work, yeah maybe. and i think there's a big element of that i think that naturally we we kind of try and do that anyway. I think there's an innate knowledge in the human body sometimes that if we breathe in a certain way, if we move, laugh, dance, it's just going to ease what we're feeling, whether we're feeling mentally negative, physically drained. And I think that a lot of that is something that we probably don't use as much as we should. I think this is a good point to harp over into karate. Here we but go. I have two questions, uh, actually three, that I want to ask you to do with physio still. So going back quickly to programming mm -hmm. and injury prevention exercises, what specifically in terms of like rep ranges and weight are you normally looking to work at? Because you're not going in with something like looking at train your rotator cuff and like in a working like 95% of your one, one rep max. You shouldn't even know what your one rep max is for rotator cuff curl. Like why would you know? That would be really niche knowledge. Yeah. Um, it depends. And this was the most frustrating thing when I was learning what I was learning in, in uni is that you, we would ask the lecturers and they would say, it depends. It always depends. It depends on the person. It depends on their training age, their history, their mentality. It depends on who they've got around them supporting them. It depends on what they've got in terms of experience with that exercise, yeah. what their goal is. If someone comes in, we'll take the same injury, but two completely different people. So they both sprained their ankle. We need to look at some ankle stability exercises. If one of them's a professional athlete and they're surrounded by people that are helping them get towards that goal, they know that their livelihood rests on it. Yeah. They know that they've got this particular sport which goes on for an exact amount of time they generally spend whatever amount of time that is running take for example a footballer they're going to be pretty much running for 90 minutes you know what the outcome is you know where you need to get them to you know that they're going to adhere to it so you know you can program it differently to someone who doesn't have any sport who's relatively sedentary who's gone over on their ankle on a curb, for example, and doesn't have the support network around them. If I programmed them both the same way, even if it's exactly the same injury, one might adhere to it and one might not because it'll be too much for the sedentary person. So as much as there's kind of this understanding of rep ranges for endurance or bodybuilding or power development, you have to then look at the person as a person, specifically when it comes to injury rehab. Because yeah. if someone's coming to you and they're saying, I'm looking at bodybuilding, I want bodybuilding rep ranges, well, you know they're invested in that outcome already. Yeah. But more than often, someone who comes in with an injury just wants to get better. They're not interested in why are we doing this amount? Why do I have to do this amount? They just want to know what to do, how often to do it, and when to do it. But then that depends. Like we said, if we've got someone who's training four times a week, I know I have to fit it in around that. Yeah. I have to know what their training looks like because if I'm going to be overexerting them for where they're at in their injury, there's no point programming it that way. But if there's someone who's sedentary, I've got more room to play with, but will they adhere to it? So it's a lot of juggling. It really is, and it really does depend. Well, that is the, it does depend. I want on a t shirt because I don't have friends, so I'm pretty much everyone of my clients. Um, so off of the back of that then, I just wanted to ask, what are a couple of common misconceptions about physio people normally have going into it? And um, let's kind of break those down a little bit, because there's a lot. There's a lot. What are some um, key <laughs> ones? Or, well, at least ones you come across regularly in your own practice. So 
I offer sports massage alongside injury rehab and a lot of people I get come in, this is a big one, they come in and they think I need to have this massage every two weeks for the rest of my life because it's done the work for me but I'm going to get back into this position. That's super common and I think it's kind of connected to how people used to run their business models. They want to get that repeat custom in. Yeah. Essentially what a sports massage is doing is it's not fixing you. Okay, it'll have lots of different physiological or mental benefits that can help you get to a position where you can enjoy your pain a little bit better, do your rehab exercises, or just forget about it long enough to get on with life and let it heal. It's, yeah. it's not, there's no magic touch. I don't have magic hands when I'm doing sports massage. I wish I did. I wish I could go, Alakazam, you're done. Not you're done, you're fixed. Um, <laughs> that would be awkward. But there's, there's no special secret behind sports massage. It's just a, it's a treatment adjunct. It's something that can help you and it won't help everyone. But you don't need it every two weeks for the rest of your life. It should be part of a program that gets you back to living, doing what you want to do without actually seeing someone like me all the time. But there's so many people out there who think I have sports massage treatments, chiropractic treatments, osteopath, acupuncture, you name it. And I see them this many times a month and that's just how it works and that's how it has to stay. Yeah. Would you say that's different for athletes though? Those perform at a high level that could probably benefit with a sports massage for recovery? There's a benefit to it. In terms of recovery, a lot of it is kind of mental and then how that kind of your mental space, whether you're in sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, right? how that affects your physiology so it does benefit pro athletes more or more so to have it more often that's a reason why there's generally a sports massage therapist or a physio or an osteo or all of the above on a professional sports team but there's not necessarily if they don't have an injury they don't need it a lot of the time they have it because it feels nice and it that it feels nice makes you feel like i'm recovered now it's all good doesn't necessarily mean that that sports massage is recovering them sometimes it's just supporting them it depends where they're at okay, it's quite interesting to talk about the psychology of a lot and i know at least for myself quite often when i book up even though everyone's like oh, it's so painful it's horrible i said even say my mum too when she's in uh her back um mm. done it before so again low back injury very common um, and especially you said around here, so equestrian-based injuries and manual labourers. So my mum, very much in the farming, so mm. kind of fit that bill. But for me, I know quite often when I book, the two main, well, three main reasons are, uh, one, I'm doing a challenge and I cannot piece the project together myself because it's got that point now where, uh, you know, the saying goes that if you can achieve your dreams on your own, then you're not dreaming big enough. So <laughs> if I can figure out the um, biomechanics of my own of a project, then it's probably not that complicated. Um, number two then is I feel like I can't address, I can't deal with the, not the pain, but I can't deal with the injury enough on my own. I've kind of exhausted what feels like my time and resources and energy trying to look after an injury and nurse and, it, and it's just not getting better or it's not getting better fast enough mm. or it's actually disrupting my quality of life but the third quite often um and this isn't when i'm not injured is i just want to treat myself sometimes if i've yeah. had a bit of a shitty month which is my pretty run down so very <laughs> fucking in soon, i then i tend to actually again with a sports massage as well is that something you see quite often I do see people that, like, not super often. Something I always say is the less I see you, the better yeah. in general. It can support your goals. It can help you make that kind of, like, initial jump to helping you treat your own injury. But the quicker I get people away from my clinic, generally, the better. Yeah. Unless they've gone off and they re-injured themselves and they're stuck in bed like this. But generally, if they're now in a better place, they're moving better, I'm happy. But I do see a lot of people who come in, more specifically super active people, and they come in and they're like, oh, I'm not particularly tight, I'm not particularly sore, I just know I feel good after a sports massage, and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't need a reason to have a sports massage, you don't need a reason to have a bubble bath. A bubble bath makes you feel better. A cup of coffee. A cup of coffee, you do need a reason to have a cup of coffee. The reason is you've woken up. Yeah. Not so official uh, advice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. 
I suppose my last question then, physio based. Actually, two. Um, He's always got two more questions. I know, he's saying I need this. Like, one more round. <laughs> um, when is. Uh, sorry, who should see a physio and when? Depends. Everyone can benefit from seeing someone who specialises in movement, right? Physio, sports therapist, osteopath, doesn't matter what you choose. Everyone can benefit from it. Obviously, you have to choose the right one. I'm not going to lie, there are some people out there who will just try and take your money. They, yeah. they exist. We all know they exist. But in general, especially if you're active, even if you feel like, yeah, it's, it's pretty good, I'm just maybe a little bit nervous. I don't want to get injured. Even if you're not injured, you can benefit. You don't have to wait until you are injured. But equally, if you've got a pretty good coach that has a good understanding of the biomechanics or, or what's being asked of your body, if you've got a good support system, you might never need to see a physio. Yeah. It, it does depend. Is there, um, so I suppose this goes back into the misconceptions, is, uh, is there an age range that people should go to physio up because... When I hand some card in my gym and say, look, go see Gary if this is persistent, but I'm not that old and I'm like, I'm, I'm 20. I started going to physio when I was like in my 20s. Like, I think mean, I was 20 when I went for my first physio session, actually. There's no age range. Good. I mean, obviously not super young children. We yeah. can treat children and adolescents. There has to be obviously an adult there. But anyone who moves can benefit from someone who knows how the body moves, yeah. right? It doesn't matter if you're you're 18, you're fresh out of school and you're just aching because you're trying the gym for the first time. Yeah. Or you're 80 and you've been training Tai Chi for the last 20 years. Yes, Tai Chi. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. Um, it doesn't matter your age range. If you've got a body that moves... Yeah. Even if you've got a body that doesn't move exactly how you want it to, but you're getting some kind of musculoskeletal pain. So something, muscles, bones, ligaments, tendons, something to do with the way that you move that hurts, they can help. Do you think, um, it's okay, Rafa. Sure. Um, do you think, even when you're young, if you first start going to the gym and you maybe you're all unsure, you haven't enough to go to physio or not, I'm a little bit achy, do you think it's quite a good idea for someone to try out a couple of different physios nearby and kind of find someone they really enjoy working with and build that relationship so they have that a bit like some friends a bar but they like yeah and have that relationship with um a physio that you can always feel comfortable going with throughout your kind of training life and active life as you evolve and grow and age and have kids and all that definitely uh, you're not going to gel with everyone. There's going to be people out there who you won't get along with, and that's fine. They might be really good at their job, but if they don't make you feel comfortable, you're not going to get the best out of that treatment. Yeah. There's, there's a massive element, especially when it comes to movement pain. You have to trust who you're working with because it's quite vulnerable when you're talking about pain, especially yeah. people who come in in chronic pain. Often there's a mental health aspect there. Whether they want to admit to it or not, it will be making them feel down. Maybe it will be making them feel depressed, anxious. Maybe it's changed how they view themselves. They're not going to tell you that if they don't trust you. And if they don't like you, they're not going to trust you. So if you go to a physio, they might be the best. They might have all the five-star ratings. Everyone might have said this is the best physio in the area or the best chiropractor or whatever. If you go there and you're not feeling like you can actually honestly talk to them about what it is you're feeling and how that's impacting your life, which is the more important part, not necessarily how you're feeling, but how it's impacting your life. If you can't say that to them, you're not in the right place. Go and try someone else. There's nothing wrong with trying different people. It's a lot of people kind of, they go to one sports massage therapist or one acupuncturist and they go, well, I see her now. That, yeah. That's that. And you go, oh, do you feel like you're getting, do you getting something out of it? And she, uh, they'll go, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. You know, you're talking about what it is that you're doing. No, I just go in and she sticks pins and needles in my face. We don't really discuss what it is that I'm after. It's not something that I feel like I could do with her. You're not getting the most out of that treatment. So yeah. try somewhere new. Try something different. And there's nothing wrong with trying everything. I wanted to go back to the programming side of things because, mm -hmm. like, everything you've said has been very logical. Make sure you get... Uh, like enough progressive overload over a long enough period of time um, and I think that's something that Taylor does very well is he's like yeah I'll, I'll do a challenge next year um, and then I'm like 
how can I do that in four weeks? <laughs> um, how how would you program it differently? I think I know the answer already, but I wanted to see what you would say. So you get Taylor coming in for a challenge. He's like, yeah, I've got a year. We know how to plan for that. Mm. If you've got someone that's got um, a little less realistic of a time frame, how would you deal with that? You've got to kind of get straight into it. If you've got a year as a time frame, you've got time to figure out and reassess and change directions if you need to. If you've got a short period of time, you've got to do all of that assessment immediately. Like you're not going to get a chance to do more assessment. You might be able to tweak, but realistically, the space of time that you've got to make those changes to adapt to what it is that you're adapting to, it's kind of all or nothing, especially if you're talking like four weeks, so something really short and sharp. So you have to almost make a decision and go with it and you have to get them on the same page as you going, right, okay, it might not be comfortable for the next four weeks, but you want to do it, we'll do it. But there needs to be still that discussion, but there's a bit more urgency behind it. Again, it depends what the goal is. If the goal in four weeks is to be able to walk up and down the stairs 60 times, I'm not too worried, right? But if the goal in four weeks is I'm going to climb Mount Snowden, like all day every day and I've never climbed it before we might want to start doing some work pretty soon okay cool any other physio stuff before you move on to martial arts yeah I got this one this will be a nice one to go to martial arts which is footwear footwear yeah how did I know that was going to come up with you because we talk about it a lot um <laughs> so I to be honest, a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. I've been an advocate of years uh, for for years now, and we're all pretty much on the same page, probably in different areas as well. To some degree, I'm regard. probably gonna like disagree on that one because I've always just worn whatever I've had whatever. because I'm cheap. You're cheap. <laughs> uh, barefoot shoes. I've been a big advocate for the years now, and they've really changed things. Like mm. my uh, my ankle health, my posture feels better with them my knees, my hips, and I find my running is massively improved uh, going barefoot and a lot of the challenges as well, like doing the, the yoke was all barefoot. I trained entirely barefoot for pen around. I didn't actually wear barefoot shoes on the day because I ended up getting tens of nights on the run up mm -hmm. to the event. Not from training for it because I was an absolute idiot with all progressive overload <laughs> when I first started running lockdown. I went from two and a half kilometers to a uh, half marathon in three weeks in barefoot shoes when my feet weren't used to them. I ended up ten times with my feet. So I was mangled for months until I got to a physio because I couldn't get out to see anyone. So what are your thoughts on modern footwear? What is there, because obviously it depends. It's it probably, depends, it's probably yeah. Really happen. it's... Uh, what are kind of some of the things you've seen around footwear and your practices? Um, and what would you recommend to people who are starting, say, going to just a general fitness class, a little bit like Broward offers, so doing a bit of strength, a bit of hip, a bit of cardio, maybe some box exercise. What would you recommend footwear-wise and what have you seen? So, probably the most common thing I see is nothing to do with barefoot shoes, although lots of people come in with questions about them because they're quite in vogue at the moment. Yeah. The biggest are. thing I they're see Gucci. is, yeah, they're big time Gucci. Um, people coming in who have trained in one shoe, not really thought about how the shoe affects our foot, our leg, our movement, bought another shoe and all of a sudden they're feeling a little bit different. So a common one I see is someone who's got quite a thick heel on their trainers. Suddenly they've bought one with like four millimeter toe drop, barely anything there. And they're feeling their calves are tight, their Achilles is hurting and they're wondering why. Well, a big part of that is they've trained for, I mean, if they're good, hopefully not too long and worn their shoes through, but typically most people wear them for a really long time. Yeah. They've trained for a really long time in a shoe that lifts their heel, that kind of chronically shortens their calves or their Achilles, everything associated when they're doing that movement. And they've gone from zero to 100 really quick. So they've dropped maybe like even 10 millimeter in that heel drop, which doesn't sound like a lot when you say 10 millimeters, people think oh, that's nothing. But it's a lot in terms of how much stretch, how much shortened your calf is. It's asking you to move it in a completely different way to what you're used to. So what I see is people coming in who've changed their shoe completely 
and it's a completely different shoe regardless of whether it's a hundred pound barefoot shoe or 20 pound sort of thing they've bought down tesco's yeah they've changed it completely and they're wondering why it hurts and it's because it will hold your foot in a different position and if you move long enough in one position your body gets used to it if you suddenly ask it to do something completely different your body doesn't know it's just a shoe your body knows that something's completely different we haven't we're not prepared for this so we're going to send you a message to say hold up what actually is going on here all right over into uh martial arts then so i think that brings us in nicely actually because i've noticed quite a lot um i've dabbled in quite a few different martial arts now like boxing tai chi uh kung fu Karate when I was a kid, which I actually just speak to you about coming back to now, which I was going to do this week <laughs> with this podcast, and then I've been stricken with the flu. And uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. And I notice obviously a lot in martial arts, barefoot is normally the way to go, or at least the shoes worn in martial arts are typically very flat as well. Yeah, I mean, typically martial artists practice barefoot. There's some differences, like some styles of kung fu have a certain type of shoe that people might a use. Slipper. A slipper, yeah, not yeah. a shoe. But a lot of it is very low to the ground. And there's a reason for that, and it's because you are looking at your stability. You're looking at, obviously, the ground's there to provide something to help you generate that force. If I was to do karate in a really spongy shoe, there's something there that's not that immediate kind of ground reaction force. It's changing the way I would move. And if I got used to it, it'd probably be fine, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. And I think that there's an element as well of how how old martial arts are. Why bother with a shoe? Why bother change what we've got? We've got a foot. It that, does that, that That's job. quite interesting that you say that. Obviously... Anyone who knows anything about a good punch is it's not coming from the shoulder and the hand. Mm. There's a lot of driving off the floor. Is It's a very, you know, we've known this for years about the kind of serape effect, whipping across the body mm. and driving up from like, the opposing foot. And it lets you deliver more force. Yet when we come to do sort of like a barbell squat, we might put like a really soft cushion shoe on. So what's the, like, the kind of difference there? And I know some people love to take their shoes off to squat, which I'm, I know I always do. Comfort. Comfort. I think a lot of modern shoes are built around comfort, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I'm saying that I'm wearing super cheap shoes that I got on a sale, and I'm the same as you. I just buy them. They work. I, I got, eventually, I'm a barefoot work. advocate. My slides you are on the I'm a lazy yeah. day. I spend most of my day barefoot. I only put the shoes on. Mainly, mostly because there's a lot of glass in Barry, which is where yeah. I live, right. So walking barefoot would probably be frowned upon there, and I'd probably get something I don't want from all the grass on the floor. Definitely. But most modern shoes are built on comfort. That's how they market them, right? This is more comfortable. Your feet won't hurt. It's going to help you move quicker. It's got cushioning. Cushioning's the big thing we talk about, and the reason why people most most people wear them is because they are comfortable. I want to go to the polar opposite then, especially in martial arts, discomfort. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a couple of different practices in martial arts. So there's a lot of, I, I, something I want to talk about later on is the differences and similarities between the modern sort of sports science literature slash strength conditioning and a lot of these ancient martial art practices mm. and how a lot of what was deemed to be BS for years is now actually being 180 flip and going actually that's legitimate <laughs> and here's loads of literature to back it up so I suppose something we've always known for martial arts then is this idea of um, the law of specific skill mm -hmm. and like what comes to mind quite often is things like Shaolin training where you where they actually look at doing things that try to train pain tolerance and mm -hmm. um, I suppose uh, bone density as well with impact uh, we took at least something like a Shaolin monk striking like a cinder block with a skull or um, breaking like a piece of bamboo wood on a shin. Like, how, how do you think that actually relates to what we understand about sports science now? So what we understand now is, again, if we introduce loads that are more than what our body wants to wants to handle, but not so much that's going to injure, our body's going to adapt to get strong enough to deal with that whether it's a reaction force, whether it's something, you know, 
cracking your head into a cinder block, as yeah. you put. I find it absolutely fascinating, this idea of like Wolf's Law, Davis's Law, how the body will change as opposed to what, what you're introducing it to. It's almost like something in a, when you're looking at martial arts, is they start slow and build up. So you start, if you're looking at callousing your knuckles or building bone mineral density in the hand and forearm, like you're not going to go from not having hit anything to hitting a brick wall and it not hurting. It won't happen. You'll hurt your hand. You will get injured. Yeah. But the practice has always been, even before we looked into all of the science as to how we're adapting, what are optimal loads, you know, what can we actually prescribe to get there without thinking about all of that martial artists knew and that's how they practice where you start soft then you hit something slightly harder then you hit something slightly harder again the people you see on youtube who were you know using their shins to kick massive metal canisters which is cool to look at they haven't just decided to pick it up and run with it they've trained to do that our body will adapt to do that and it looks really cool so it, it, it is legitimately real as well it's mm -hmm. not just um, John Wick. <laughs> it, is, it, it is a real valid thing that I remember you saying this before in the session. Me is like your body can adapt to almost anything if it's got enough time and the load is right. In yeah. theory, I mean, like you're not going to adapt to learn to fly and sprout wings. Yeah, but if the time is put in, if the training is put in, if the load is right, your body will get stronger. It will get more mobile. It will be able to deal with things. That you're asking it to deal with repetitively so your body gets really good at doing something it knows that you're going to ask it to do again and again because your body and your brain's purpose is to keep you alive and there'd be absolutely no point in being introduced to one force and then consistently getting injured by that force if it knows it's going to keep happening it's going to do its very best to adapt you obviously have to then temper what you're doing to give it the time to heal so that it can get stronger but it can get stronger. I'm not going to lie, some of the things you see out there on Instagram or on Facebook or YouTube it is like how they call it bullshitto rather than bushido. Like it is, yeah, it is people who are just taking the mick or they've got people kind of trained to see things a certain way. Yeah. But for as much crap as you see, there is an equal amount of genuinely good martial arts practice. And there's a reason why people train in a certain way. There's a reason why you can see someone who's trained for a really long time and they'll be hitting, you know, planks of wood and they're not cutting their knuckles open. It's because the bodies adapt to that. If you ask a complete newbie to do that, they'll, they'll probably cut their knuckles open because the skin isn't hard enough. The, is this something you actually do within your own crafty practice? Yes. I think that it's an interesting that you've you've kind of touched on it because it definitely is something that could do with more research into it. And yeah. I say that knowing that that's coming from probably something you'd be looking at talking about is a very Western mindset. Yeah. The need to understand why as opposed to just knowing, well, that's the outcome and so that's what we'll do. There's definitely room to research into it because there are some people that don't know how to properly kind of manage those loads. There are there are instructors out there who will go, right, in order to condition your knuckles, you're just going to hit the heavy bag and you're going to hit the heavy bag a hundred times every single day until you stop bleeding. And I, that's, I this. <laughs> yeah, that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. It doesn't mean it won't eventually work if you've got enough recovery time, but there is a way to do it without necessarily cutting your knuckles open and injuring yourself all the time. It would be the same as squatting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, you wouldn't get someone that's never squatted to then go and squat 100 kilos every single day and then be like, at some point you're going to lift that. Yeah, and exactly. And just be like, yeah, come on, that's going to work. That's, that makes sense. Your body adapts, but it needs to have the room to adapt. It needs that progressive overload. You, you're not going to, without any other kind of training, go from lifting nothing to lifting 100 kilos just by attempting it every day. Unless you're getting some really good isometrics in and not like folding in half, <laughs> right? I think it's, so. Oh, sorry. No, it's, it's just that the adaptation is the same. Whether you're looking at getting stronger, avoiding injury, increasing bone mineral density, it, it's all the kind of the same basic theory is that if it's gradual enough and if it's programmed in the right way, your body will adapt. 
I think it was really interesting what you said about how the need to understand the very Western mindset. Mm. And so it actually is important for some people because, as they said, don't just go in. And I did this in lockdown, actually. I, I was doing Tai Chi for a while. And I started just punching the plank of wood because we were doing, when it, after the Tai Chi class, we do Kung Fu at the end. And I started, we were doing a one-inch punch quite a lot, which mm. was, you know, I love Bruce Lee, yeah. so for me this was really exciting. So I went home and I was just punching this one door, oh my God, no, no, and I bust my knuckles to pieces doing it. But this need to um, understand, you said, when they marry together, do you think there's this really nice kind of middle point between the Western and the Eastern kind of um, philosophy and approach to sports and the physical um, industry where we can take this ancient wisdom, kind of understand it in more data-driven mm. terms, and then from there find like the best application using the best of both worlds? I think that there should be. Whether that's something that anyone would ever be able to marry, because I think the need to understand the scientific basis behind things is always going to drive that research, and there's a good reason why we do that research, right? Yeah. But equally, the kind of innate knowledge that we have in our body, like... For example, you've just done something super taxing on the body. You're absolutely knackered. You need to get your breath back. Innately, you're going to go towards like a forward hinge position. You're going to try and pop your hands on your knees and let your rib cage kind of expand. That's going to be how you're going to try and breathe. Yeah. For years, we were told, no, no, no. This is how we want to breathe. Hands behind your head, shoulders back, open the rib cage that way. And now we know that actually that's, that's not the case. And what we innately knew was actually better for recovery. But without the science to do that, we wouldn't get people on board with that kind of thinking. I think in an ideal world, you would take the science, you would take the philosophy, I guess, the kind of like generational wisdom, you'd marry the two and you'd just coach. And you'd use it as what works, works. You know, if it works, don't break what's broken. But I think you do need the two. I swear whether that you could have just that middle ground without the two opposing forces. I don't think you could just narrow it down to just having that middle ground. Yeah, so that is physical training. Mm. What about the same for mental training? Because this same sort of movements happen at the moment now, and I'm a really big fan of seeing it happen, where a lot of the more Eastern kind of philosophies around mindset and mentality, mm -hmm. particularly now we're getting in more into the... Um, the mental health and the mentality and discipline of uh, martial arts. Uh, there seems to be some sort of change going on now where a lot of practices that seemed a little bit woo-woo for years are suddenly begin a lot of actual um, scientific study, things like meditation, mm -hmm. uh, certain ideas in terms of therapy with practices that came from the classic one we see actually at the moment is things like you've got Jungian psychology and then you've got this idea of the shadow. So the shadow is this like inner child, if you've ever heard this before, it's yourself and this um, idea of kind of like your ego and all that. And long before any of that, in, in like ancient Eastern philosophy, we have these same sort of models that existed and this idea that you need to learn to let go and you need to follow the flow and you need to not let the past weigh down on you. And I was seeing this sort of move over a lot more into uh, popular culture where mm. headspace, you know, years ago, when I was in the school, I was like, right, I meditate. Everyone was like, you're a Buddhist. <laughs> and I, I, you have to be a Buddhist because you meditate. And now it's like, Everyone has had space. Everyone has like the karma app, or they listen to like theta waves or meditation music or something. And it's so common practice now. But fifteen years ago, it was like this was unheard of, and someone thought you were going to be chucking crystals around and barking at the moon if you're interested. It might still be if it helps you. Um, yeah, I think that a lot can be said for popularity. I don't know whether it will always be, particularly, again, we're going to come back to the Western world, I don't know whether it'll always be popular. I don't know whether, you know, cold ice baths are always going to be popular. At one point in time, it was popular to not eat gluten, and there was science to back it up, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the science now completely agrees with it. I think that if there's some kind of correlation between ancient practices that have happened for a long time and remained relatively unchanged. There's probably, like I say, that's some kind of generational wisdom there, like you do it for a reason, yeah. even if you don't understand it. If it's linked to something like that, maybe it'll stick around longer. But again, I do think that a lot of people need to know the why 
to understand whether or not it's valuable to them. I think a lot of it has just gone in like cycles from mm -hmm. what I've observed is like meditation because that was quite popular in like the 70s and 80s and then it went out and now it's back in same with like ice baths like all of that sort of stuff it's like really. fashion isn't it yeah uh, so, uh, psychedelics were very popular back then as well same sort of time <laughs> now again very interested big push for uh legalizing mm. like sex um so moving on from that then more into um i want to go deeper into the karate practice what karate uh, practices do you do because you don't just do one and what the kind of different approaches and within those the mindsets that you notice so i do two different styles of karate but they're both very similar the movement's different i'd say one is more flowy and one is more choppy like so more straight to the point they're both full contact styles of karate so there's a lot of conditioning is is what we call it or callousing that kind of like iron body technique where you're looking at hardening the body to blows there's a lot of that involved because it is basically full contact you're going to take the punch different styles of karate do different styles of fighting some of them do point scoring and that's what you would have seen in the olympics which is kind of like a semi-contact you're given set rules to work within i'm not so much competitive i'm not a very competitive person so the competitive style of karate isn't what drew me to it i'm the same yeah well i, I started karate when I was 13, right, and I wouldn't have started it if I hadn't been bullied in school. Yeah. I wasn't drawn to it because I wanted to win a medal or because there was a competition or because I watched Karate Kid, which is, Cobra Kai is a big reason that my club is super busy now with kids. I love Cobra Kai. I love Kai. Cobra Kai. So cheesy, but so good. Um, but that wasn't any of the reason for it, for me. For me, it was because I was bullied. I didn't have a very good mindset. I didn't have anything to do. My brother was doing karate. I saw it and I thought, well, you know, give it a go. It might help. And it did. But for me, it's not because I can compete. It's not because I can fight. It's not even because of the actual movements themselves, even though obviously I love it. I could tell you here and now everything that happened in my first session. And that was 16, 17 years ago. I can remember it because I can remember having a moment while I was doing that first session of thinking this is something I can focus on that isn't all the crap that's going on it gives me something productive to do and I think that a lot of people depending on their sport their hobbies it gives them something productive to focus on that gives them an outlet for anything life might throw at you and that for me is what karate is it's an outlet it's a way that I live my life it's a way that I focus on things differently that helps me deal with everything else. I just want to pick up on, you said about you don't do it to compete and you don't do it to fight. Mm. And obviously there's always this big argument of what's the most effective martial arts. Yeah. Um, and from my understanding, karate is not the most effective martial arts. Not on its own. So what would you say is like the benefits of doing karate for those that aren't looking to fight and compete because there are a lot of benefits yeah. um, but again if you're looking to fight and compete there's other things you need to look at as well as karate yeah. so the best martial art doesn't exist right the best combination of martial arts does it's Jeet Kune Do isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah we'll just go with that briefly <laughs> all knowing is all good. No, it's something that combines stand-up and throwing and grappling, and very few styles combine all of them. And if they do, they don't teach them all in equal measure. You need an equal amount of all of them. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is so super popular at the moment. And brutal. <laughs> but it doesn't teach you any striking. And yeah. from a self-defense point of view, if, if you find yourself needing to use joint locks and arm locks, yeah, BJJ's taught you that, it's all good. But if someone swings a massive punch at you in a pub brawl, you're not going to sit down on the floor and wait for them to come at you that way. You have to be Why able to deal with that. Yeah, well. like, come, yeah. come on, let's roll. Come at me, bro. Like, wait, wait for some to go up. So the best <laughs> combination for fighting or for self-defense, it's a combination of something that does ranged fighting, something that does closer fighting and looking at the two because you could find yourself in any position where you need to be able to defend, defend yourself. 
And the best defense is not getting on in that position in the first place. Like the best self defense is being three states left of, of west of where the danger is, but you can't always be that way. From a kind of what benefit do you get from various different martial arts? It's the same as any exercise. You get a community, you get to challenge yourself, you get to drive your mindset, you get to do things you've never done before, you get the health benefits, the joint benefits, the cardiovascular benefits, and if you want to compete, yeah, you get that as well. It's, it depends. <laughs> yeah, so there's a more unique mental component to martial arts compared to any, most other forms of training. I think there's a different element because I think that it's a massive part of martial arts. Yeah. It's, it's something that was taught alongside it is the mindset. You look at any kind of traditional martial art, karate, I'm going to take because I know I know it better, they have, they have a set of kind of almost like guidelines or dojo rules as to how you should conduct yourself, not only when you're training, but in everyday life. And those rules include things like being courteous, being disciplined, having respect. It's not just, you know, when you're here, you work really hard. It's at all times, you should be striving to be the best person you could possibly be. And that's not necessarily something that gets taught as part of other sports. I think maybe it's a side It's almost the opposite in some uh, sports. Oh, well, in some sports, for sure. I mean, you could don't get me started on the difference between martial arts and mixed martial arts. I think there's a big thing to be said there in terms of, for me, martial arts include that mindset, it includes that discipline. And I think that MMA is more of a mixed combat sport than I, a mixed yeah, martial art. I, I definitely agree. I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm very much like you with, I'm not too into competing. Mm -hmm. The only competition I'm actually interested in is the one I have between who I am now and who I was yesterday. I like competing against myself and pushing and breaking down my own barriers, but I, I really can not give a shit what someone's lifting next to me or how fast they've done something. Um, I got into BJJ, um, at a time in my life, I just wanted to challenge myself and get on my campus in a bit more. And I loved the physical side of it, and it was terrifying. Just going up against someone who'd mm. been doing it for years in purple belt. It's like, you're going to roll with him for two minutes. He's going to try to kill you. And <laughs> I remember the first time, it was like, you just slap, punch each other's hands. That's the only contact to, like, strike it. Yep. And then after <laughs> that, it was like, just try, like, yeah. rip each other apart for two minutes. And it was the most brutal and tiring intense two minutes i've ever had in my life rolling and i had a massive respect for those guys and what you're doing going through and at the time when i joined the club was doing gi training mm. so training in gi now unfortunately well fortunately and unfortunately fortunately we've moved into a new gym at brown and i haven't been able to and it has been great but i on the bad side of it i haven't been able to go and do uh, bjj anymore and i haven't been able to do tai chi uh, at all anymore which are the two things that i feel i massively missed out my training which is why i'm not going to go into karate now mm. but one thing i noticed as soon as we stopped doing any uh, sort of gi training in bjj i really didn't enjoy it as much anymore and i noticed there's a very big difference in mindset and it doesn't seem to be very like there was no sort of like philosophy of that even though there is the philosophy of the heart of bjj it wasn't very present in the, in the club and as soon as we stopped doing uh gi training it very much felt like i was like an MMA sort of gym and whilst like that was really cool and the guys they were amazing and they were like a lot of them were like XM as well they were really humble like salt the earth people I, just, I met some really lovely people there and like I wish I could see more but I just can't fit in the week unfortunately but I didn't feel like that martial art was necessarily giving me that kind of same um more philosophical and more kind of uh, code to live by that I was craving in my life at the time I just, I disagree. You disagree? Yeah, I think it all, as always, it depends. It will depend on the coach. It depends what you're looking or getting out of it. I think all of it will just depend on the individuals and, like I said, what they're looking to get out of it. Because for some people, the phil philosophy might be there for the no-gi training because that's what they want to get out of it. There's qualities that they're missing in their life that they're gaining well, well, from no, doing I, I totally agree on that. I was saying for me, yeah. I, I, I did, it didn't scratch that itch for me and what I wanted because I'm not a very... But um, I don't think it should be like looked at as this is now like a different thing and there's like all these different values to it. I think it's very just dependent, like I said, on the coach and on 
you as an individual. So for you, it might not be a great thing, but I yeah. also don't think it should be said. Yeah, that's not as good as this thing. And if oh, I, I, I don't. I think it, again, it very much depends on the individual what they're looking for. But I said for me, it wasn't really for me. It didn't really fit what I was looking to get out of martial art. I went into it at least in the way that I gel with it. For someone else who's going in, who's looking for maybe discipline and instruction, maybe maybe you need to go get your ass kicked by a grown ass uh, adult and be humbled into submission or choked a few times. Because you're going down the man. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you that I, I went in there and I was laughing a lot of the time yeah. because one of my kind of things is a cheerful, cheerfulness in the face of adversity, which I know is that is the the Royal Marines thing as well, uh, which I learned recently, which I love. And I've always laughed no matter what's happening. And I could be lying on the floor with someone's knee on my throat and I'd be laughing. <laughs> it would just be a bit like taking me out of it mm. a little bit. Um, so I suppose for me, I do like that sense of um, following it. Not like a tradition, but I like there's that kind of like, I remember when I did cry when I was a, a kid, there was a sense of like ritual to it too. You came in, you... Um, when you came in, you acted very differently into the room, the way you sort of um, entered, where you left your equipment, uh, how you greeted other people, how you greeted your teacher. And there was very much a sense of, um, like, there was a bit of ceremony to it. And I know um, some people like to scoff at tradition, but then there's a reason tradition survived for so long as well and serves a sort of purpose to instill sort of uh, certain values in. And is that something you feel like within the clubs you have is very much integral to karate versus, uh, not versus, I don't know how to say versus, but is that something you feel is integral to karate itself? I think it comes back to what Will said. It depends on the community. It yeah. depends. It depends on the community. I've trained karate with tons of different clubs and I've stuck with two and there's a reason I've stuck with two and it's because the community suits me and the community of those two includes the traditional aspect it includes the respect I've gone to traditional karate dojos that don't have that as by what their instructors saying or by what the actual community of the dojo does and the feeling's completely different it's still karate training but even though they're in their geese they've done their traditional bowing there's no element of almost respect. It feels more competitive. Yeah. And that goes out the window. It's not necessarily a style to style thing. I think it's a gym to gym thing. It depends on how it's being taught, what the kind of role model is, what the expected behavior is. I've been to jujitsu gyms where they include the, the more traditional and they have the bow in the handshake at the end. They have like a, a warm up that they conduct together, and that always feels better to me than the jujitsu gyms I've gone into, where it's like, yeah, you warm yourself up, and when then we're straight into kind of rolling, we might do a few drills, but it's really relaxed. I like the structure. Other people, they like the free flowing side of things, so it depends what you want out of it. Uh, yeah, I agree on that. Um, talking then a little bit more about the uh, mental aspect about it, mm -hmm. and this is based off a one-word conversation you had with me yeah. the other day. <laughs> um, I've been, so as I said, for me the reason I feel like I want to come back to karate now, it's not just watching Karate Kid and the fact that my nickname in the gym is Daniel San because of a baby <laughs> face. Um, for me, what's been missing in my training the last few years is I train alone very often now. Mm. I don't have a sense of community with the way I train. Even if I got forced to train, I'm very much kind of uh, my own business when I'm there. I, I don't train my headphones on. Um, I like to chat with other people around me. But I feel like I train alone. And quite often, if I'm training alone, especially at Brown, I've got my laptop there because I'm training between work. I've got emails firing off. Even if I put my phone on, like, I'm signing quite a lot, I'm checking it for emails, I've got people messaging me, and there's not much flow happening in my training these days. I'm very much not zoned in, I'm kind of doing it in between. The intensity is still there, I'm making loads of progress, and enjoying it, but in between the sets, it's like, you've got two minutes to kill because yeah. you ain't left in. Oh, I'll just check my emails. Uh, so for me, that sense of flow used to be very integral to my training, and I feel like I've lost a lot of it now. And I got back into training my mace a little bit more recently. The steel mace was, was swinging around doing all these sort of ad hoc flows and not even trying to choreograph them either, but just playing around with it and yeah. see how it feels. And you messaged me off a story and you just sent me one word. And what was that? I sent you the word motion because yes. you said some no mind time. Yes. And I literally just commented motion. So motion is literally translated, I mean, 
technically mind of no mind and it's associated with martial arts and it's this idea that you find the flow state where you're not consciously thinking about what it is that you need to do you're relaxed and your body reacts to what you need to do there's no conscious thought there it's just part of who you are if that makes sense yeah so i'd say um no mind no mind is the I think it was the literal translation. Mm. I can't remember the actual word is in Chinese because it literally translates to no mind. The word does. Um, I'm familiar with that from Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Mm. Um, it's present in all sports and all activities to some degree. I, I even remember something that used to get me a flow a lot was when I worked in coffee shops, was mm. making coffee. But I think martial arts has been more, because of the philosophical aspect of it, there's always, it's kind of been more part of that I've talked about more in that culture, but now it's in um, more sports, particularly surfing as well. I think it's got a good yeah. for it. What about, um, or what within your own karate uh, practice do you find puts you in that flow state? And is there like a certain amount of variables, or parameters that you should influence maybe within your own training environment to bring it about? Lots of different things affect it. Um, I mean, flow state is super popular. It's a bit of a buzzword at it the is. moment. And it's something, anything that you've done long enough, repetitively enough, you can hit that flow state because, you know, you're thinking muscle memory, bit of a misnomer. It's, it's your brain forging those pathways and getting really good at using them. Yeah. But your body can do it without you necessarily having to think about it. But it depends on your headspace again. If you're in your head and you're thinking about something that's happened all that day, it's a lot harder to reach that kind of flow state. If you're kind of more relaxed, if you've you've settled out your breathing, your heart rate's come down, there's nothing really dragging on you from the rest of the day, it's a lot easier to hit it. So for me, doing kata, which is an element of karate, it's one of the three main elements. It's a series of kind of like set movements that go together. That, for me, is the easiest way for me to reach flow state. I've done them so many times, I don't necessarily have to think about them. Um, I do different versions of some of them now, and some of them do take more thinking. If I'm doing the version I'm less familiar with, I don't really hit that kind of like flow state or that no mind state. But the ones that I've done for ages, that gives me a release. And I like that I will train it in my own time, outside of anything and everything, because it's a set series of movements that I've done so many times that if I need to work, if I need to exercise, and I don't want to think about it, and I don't want to feel like every break I'm taking, I've got to go and look at my phone, that's what I'll go to. And I think it's interesting that you say when you're training, you're, you're struggling to find that headspace recently because you're training on your own and you're kind of accountable to yourself and your phone is right there. Yeah, that's my environment where I am. I'm literally in my workplace. Yes, yeah. environment plays a massive, massive part. And I think that's why a lot of people do find a flow state in a martial arts class, because it's a class, same as they would in a class at a gym. They're not the instructor, they're not looking at the time, they're just doing what they're being told to do. There's no, especially with traditional martial arts, you're not checking your phone. No. Absolutely no way. You won't be allowed to unless you're on call, really, for most dojos. So you can forget about it, because anything that happens with it, well, you don't need to look at it for the next 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half. Who cares? And that takes it off of your mind. You don't need to worry about it anymore. You're not thinking about it anymore. You can think about what you're doing. You know, you've done it so many times, maybe you don't need to think about what you're doing. Maybe you can just relax and do it. What are the benefits of, for you, because you said that it's hard to get into it when you've had a bit of a, a shitty day, there's a lot of stress going on, but that's so often the reason kind of why I feel I need to get into yeah. this space. It helps massively. I mean, if you sit there and you think and you've had a crap day and you do nothing but focus and ruminate on the crap day you've had, it's going to feel more crap. Yeah. It's, it's if you think on one thing you almost like this idea of manifesting it if you just think and think and think on it that's all you're going to be able to see if it's here i can't see you all i can see is the problem yeah. but if i take it away and i'm not looking at it i'm not focusing on it i've got something else to focus on it becomes less of a problem so it is it's almost like this nice contrast in that the time when you need it the most is the 
the time when it's hardest to access that kind of mindset. I think what you picked up on there on having it so you don't have to focus on it, you have to focus on something else is something that really gets me into my flow mm -hmm. is I can't do something like for you as a kata. I wouldn't be able to do a kata no matter how many times I've practiced it, it wouldn't get me into my flow state mm -hmm. because it would be too easy that I'd still be thinking about that thing. So I need something that's challenging enough and for some people it's physical for me it's mental i like doing um soloing when i'm rock climbing yeah that gets me into flow because it's dangerous enough that it's getting me like focused on it and energized but it's not i'm not doing stuff that's super challenging that is at my absolute limit because then i'll just be bricking it and i'll just be like what if i fall what if and there'd be all the what ifs so it's getting that level of focus where it's like, I need to focus this amount. And I think that's what changes with everyone's version of flow. Because yeah. for yours, doing a kata, doing stuff that is safe and you've done millions of times, that gets you into the flow. And that just wouldn't do it for me. I need that extra element of, I have to focus a bit more. Have that you ever done any sort of cats or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. What martial art was that? Well, I've done karate, I've done taekwondo, jujitsu. Um, Ninja too. So yeah, I've done a few. Um, do my highest level was karate. That, is the headspace potentially? Or do you think that's just down to your kind of zone you need to be in for flow is a little bit different? It's just, again, everyone's different. Yeah. Everyone's got different needs. Um, I think I need to be quite wired all the time. You need I can't, the I, I can't relax. <laughs> I'm constantly doing stuff. I've been at a competition all day, I was talking to the people, they're like, oh, are you going to go home, relax, go to bed? I was like, no, I've got a podcast and I'm going for a run. <laughs> they're like, how do you do it? I'm like, how do you not do it? There's just, you got to do stuff. You can't just sit around. I'd be bored if I was sat down watching a movie now. I've been both headspaces. Yeah. I've been both. So I've been the person who works three jobs, studies two different degrees, one of them full time, coach for eight hours, volunteer eight hours, go home, have to do homework, this, that and the other, work on projects. Like I've been that, I've been the person that cannot switch off and I've been the person that can switch off. I've had the mindset of both. There's a healthy middle ground, um, but that kind of busy mindset I can get. I can get the need to focus on something and for me that's why it is kata. It might be the thing that I've done X, Y, Z number of times, but there's no such thing as a, as a perfect kata. It doesn't exist. Every time I do it, it might be 1% better. It might be worse if I'm, not, if I'm not in the right mindset and I'm not focusing, but it might be 1% better, but there's no such thing as the perfect kata. It can always be better. And that's why for me, it's my flow state because it's that I am consistently chasing that improvement. And it requires thought, but it doesn't require conscious thought. It yeah. requires me to clear my mind, know exactly what i got to do, and work as hard as I can at it. Yeah, and I think for me, it's just not not quite physically or mentally demanding mm. enough for me to warrant the focus. I need that little bit more, because that's what I'm interested in. Like, when I'm going out soloing, I need... Because it's not just free soloing, it would be rope soloing, but anything where it's like, I have to fully concentrate on this, otherwise something's going to happen to me, then that will like, just make me instantly switch and be like, okay, cool, you're in the zone now. And no matter what I'm doing, I know if I'm climbing a certain grade solo, I'm in that state, and mm. I won't even realise what how long I've been climbing. I'll be like lost in time, just me in that moment. Yeah. Whereas like doing something I've done a million times it just won't get me there. It comes back to different motivations. Different yeah. things are going to drive you forwards. Yeah. Or you can do a cater on the edge of the cliff if you want. Yes. We'll see if that works for you. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you said it about how environment is obviously massive when mm -hmm. it comes to it. What do you think some of the parameters that um, so say the average gym goer, I'm actually writing a post about this earlier from okay. Brown, so, uh, it's just right on the tip. <laughs> What are some of the parameters that you think we should have a look at? Um, <coughs> so we flu. <laughs> so we imp we manipulate a couple of different mm. variables and parameters to train. What um, variables and parameters should we have a look at manipulating within our environment and the way we approach uh, any?
any training practice to try and give us more opportunity to access this flow state. For you, you need danger, <laughs> you need high voltage. I get that. Like whenever I've been outdoor climbing with you, I've totally forgot about any problem I've ever had in my life. When I get on the wall, I feel quite high. Mm. And I've got a proper buzz, and I, I have that flow. But then when I've done Tai Chi, and when they're in the town hall, and you do like a 15 minute long sequence, and it's not, I say it's not that physically demand, it is super physically demanding yeah. actually. So I was trying to say that, there's no way. Phil will come for you if you say that. Yeah, Phil is going to come for you, he's going to go on here soon. <laughs> and yeah, I remember the first time I met him, I went up to him afterwards, shook his hand, I was like, that was such an incredible, like, athletic feat watching someone do that stuff. Like the kick where he goes foot up in the air. <laughs> like above head height and then drops into the splits and then the splits just comes about it into some sort of punch or something. Wow. Uh, so what are the parameters that you think we should have a look at manipulating for not training but for the flow of training? Is that from the person who's training or from the person who's coaching's point of view? Uh, let's go from the person who's training. So say I was just average gym mm. goer, so I go to Cardiff and I go to Pure Gym or something. What would I look at trying to manipulate my own uh, day or approach to training to try and give myself more access to that flow state? I think that your mindset going in is going to change. Whether you're like in fight and flight and really stressed and had a really shit day or whether you've really calmed down, you're open to what it is that you're going to do. You're happy to focus on it and nothing's taking your mindset elsewhere is important. Yeah. But I do think that environment's important as well and it has to work for you. So if going to Pure Gym works for you and jumping on the treadmill and putting your headphones on and just going, if that works for you, don't change what ain't broken. Yeah. But a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. A lot of people need something different. They need something that makes them feel either safe or challenged, right? Transitive. You need danger, other people need safety. I think that from a from a flow state, from an exercise state, from enjoying your exercise, everybody's different. I'm a big believer that there is at least one form of movement or exercise out there for everybody that you will enjoy that will help you reach that flow state. And not everybody finds it. Some people come in and they'll be like, I hate the gym, I hate running, I just don't want to exercise. And it's like, you have to then go, well, have you tried this, 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 and this? They think it, it, this is the box of how I can move, how I can move my body and how I can move for health. And they don't think outside of that box. Like, for example, what you guys do with the adventure athlete stuff, a lot of people would not think I can go and learn to rock climb and free solo and that can be my movement and my training for the day. Lots of people think I, I have to go to the gym. That's how I keep healthy. Yeah. Lots of people wouldn't think I'm going out and I'm surfing and that's how I'm getting that's my, my cardio. Yeah, they don't think that. They think oh, I'm going out and I'm having a bit of a laugh on the water. But they might enjoy that because it's a bit of a laugh on the water. I think that we try and put ourselves in this box. And for a lot of people, being in that box is not going to help you reach that flow state because you're just doing what it is you feel like you have to do to be the person you feel like you're supposed to be because everybody else is doing it. Try different things. Do you think there's a sort of like an optimal zone that each person has for flow with? There needs to be enough challenge, but there also needs to be a... Um, it can't be too hard either because if it's too hard, then there's this point of failure where you either just fail the movement and take yourself out of it mm -hmm. or the actual psychological stress builds up too much and it just compromises being that state because there's just a lot there's an, you have to start getting the hang out to get the lift yeah. in properly or there's a lot of anger fail this or you like physically tell, you're mentally telling yourself like you're not good enough you like beat yourself up you know a bit of a John Crease. yeah it's different people respond to stress in different ways like I could not be a competitive power lifter I wouldn't respond to that stress in the same way that competitive power lifters do I don't have the the right level of maybe aggression for it I just go yeah, okay, all right, I'm going to go over here and I'm, I'm going to do a different movement. But some people, they respond really well to that. So it depends. It depends what movement resonates best with you. Yeah. What, what are you doing when you feel like you're at your best? Some people, they run and they go, oh, my head space is perfect now. I've completely cleared everything. Other people run and they come back and they're like, that was the worst 45 minutes of my life and I did nothing but think about my lungs. Running's not going to be a flow state, likely. Not unless you do a lot of work on it and you're really, really, really persistent. Do you find that the... Go 
when in flown karate, when you come outside then, does it come into other areas of your life a lot more? I, I quite often wonder, um, when you're all doing physio, obviously we're normally talking a lot, mm. especially with me because I'm like, shut up, tangents for Taylor. <laughs> but so that's like you, your second podcast, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, do you get into quite a flow, like, I always imagine you probably get into a flow when you're actually working, when you're actually feeling out the muscle and you're trying to get a sense of what's it doing, how can I feel, and you're watching for actions out on someone's back. Do you find that you get in a lot of flow outside of karate as well? I don't seem to flow at work. I don't think that I would want to either. A lot of what I do is almost like puzzle solving because people yeah. come in and it is find the right bits to fit that puzzle to get them to where they want to be. And no two cases are the same. And I think that my job as a therapist is to be present and to listen to them. A lot of what they need to have happen is just someone listen to how it's impacting yeah. on them sometimes. So I don't really think that I hit that flow tape, flow state in, in how we're talking about it, in that kind of like mind of no mind where you're just not consciously there, but your body's doing the work. I don't think I get that in work, and I don't think I'd want to. That's but I do find it outside of karate. There are other things for me that I can go to to find that flow state. I quite enjoy running. I quite enjoy uh, stand-up paddleboarding. I like going out and just walking, especially through forests. There's something about walking in forests for me, that just works for me. I'm the same. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit of greenery, that works. But I don't think I find it at work. I did used to. So when I used to work in customer service, I used to work in a bakery, it would be the same job every single day. I didn't necessarily have to engage with anybody because I was behind the scenes. I'd find flow state there and the day would just go past. Sometimes the day would just go by really quickly. Sometimes it would drag, but sometimes it would go by really quickly. That's quite interesting because some people say I get in a, a workflow mm. and I sat at home working on a computer and a spreadsheet and they're really consciously thinking when they do it. I think some people have got a misconception about what flow is versus no mind because no mind is very much this idea of actually detaching from like almost any emotion mm. while you're doing it as well and then some people are like yeah i get in the flow when i go in the gym i, I chug my one set of the gym put my headphones <laughs> on and put some death leopard on and then i hit the squat rack and i'm screaming at the top of my lungs and i'm like that's not flow that's yeah. that's very different that's that's psyched up and that's a performance zone and I think when we got like a laptop, we sit down and work as well, and you got your coffee there, and we chuck some lo fi on. Again, it's a type of mindset or kind of like arousal, psychological, before anyone says anything. <laughs> but it's not necessarily that no mind. Mm. Whereas, as I said, I used to find it making coffee when I worked in a coffee shop, and you could just switch off, and the, move it, the movement became yeah. autonomous. But every, I remember we had Craig on, and Craig said that. Um, so it was the parkour dude we had on and we talked about Bruce Lee on there as well and we talked about this quote which I love which is using no way as way mm. and he said that you would just step back a second and you'd like you'd slow you were going to grab your cap and, all you'd be like, and then you'd be like and you like weren't thinking and you were like very detached from it and I used to I found that quite a lot working in a coffee shop um, do you think that having a lot of that in your day to day is actually quite impactful for kind of getting out of your head a lot when you suffer mental health because i know for me when i suffer mental health um not when because mental health is like a continuous ongoing thing throughout life but when when it feels like it's flared in particular i craft and craft and try to meditate a lot and i find that it actually doesn't help when instead i'm spending 10 minutes or so, 20 minutes sat there thinking about a problem instead of actually mm. detaching from it? I think that it depends. Oh, Some I love people, this. I love it. as all it's going to be is to, it depends today. Some people respond differently. Yeah. And some people will find flow even when they're in a mental, mentally bad headspace, and some yeah. people won't. Um, for me, flow particularly, I always like to think of it as so the way that I personally engage with that kind of meditation flow space where you're not necessarily doing anything but you're trying to empty your mind is you think about your thoughts like waves you don't try and stop them you let them come and you let them go you're not yeah. attached to them and i think that that's quite useful day to day i think that 
this idea of no mind a lot of people might take it to be yeah cool I'm not gonna think at all I'm gonna go out there and do my day to day and have no conscious thought I know people who are like that and not because they're in a flow state um, <laughs> I don't think that that might help I've just insulted everyone that lives I'm, near nah, me now. I can agree <laughs> um I think that it's yeah it depends on the person some people will be able to respond to mental health in one way versus another way some people need to move some people need to switch off some people need a distraction some people need to sit down and genuinely work through what it is they've got going on for me if there's something bad going on I have to write it down if I don't write it down it's going to stay in my head but if I write it down, I know that I don't have to hold on to it. Because even if it's negative, it exists elsewhere. It doesn't have to stay in my head. But some people might go through that action of writing whatever it is that's dragging them down and looking at it and thinking, oh, this is so much worse than I thought. <laughs> and now it's on paper. It depends how you're going to react to it. It depends what's going to help you get into that flow state. It depends what your personality is what your enjoyment is what what you like what you hate who you live around what your community is what they're telling you is acceptable versus unacceptable like you you talk about meditation now and it's still you know even though it's more popular it's still a bit ooh for some people so you yeah. might say i'm gonna go off and meditate and some people might go all right you got the crystals out of you you're gonna strip off in the full moon and they'll take the piss out of you for it yeah and other people might go yeah i do that every night as well and it really helps me so it depends on your community as to how you can best access that flow state i definitely agree on that i'm going to work and we'll do a little bit of like down regulation breath work in the session some people are like oh that's great i love mm -hmm. it thank you go home my brother is there and he's like oh you're gonna go align the stars <laughs> and sit down and put your tinfoil hat on always the people the you're work. related to the, always the i go for the throat it depends on your mindset again so a lot of my practice in work comes from my experience of chronic pain and yeah. chronic pain is super linked to you know mental health issues to being depressed to being anxious and when i went in i had i, I had a million different ones physio interventions i tried everything and i had one that was focused on the science of pain and how you can address that within the body rather than why are you feeling pain because of things external to the body that was the one that was particularly useful for me but at that time, I was so stressed out, I was so hyped up that even though they did elements of downregulation, of breath work, of meditation at the end of the session, I couldn't do it. Yeah. The lights would be off, everyone would be lying down, they'd be doing whatever it is they're doing. They've, they've tried to minimize every single stimulus and stressor in that room and I could not engage with it. And nowadays it's completely different. What was that practice you wanted to do? That sounds quite interesting. Which one? You said well, they were focusing on um, not just the pain in the body, but what was externally sort of causing the pain as well. What, what was that kind of practice? Then curious about that. So that was looking at the science of why we feel pain. Yeah. So very typically we think that pain is something external has hurt us and that's why it hurts. We only feel pain because the brain tells us to feel pain. And sometimes the brain gets oversensitive to certain things. So in my case, I'd had an injury. I was in pain for a real reason, but it had healed. I had chronic pain for four or five years. It was for a long time. There was no lasting damage. But what had happened is my central nervous system had got really overprotective and it was just sending me pain signals all the time. And I couldn't break out of that loop. There was nothing external that was causing that pain. Certain movements, certain situations made it worse and that wasn't necessarily because the danger existed around me. It's because that's how my central nervous system perceived the danger to be. So a lot of that was looking at the science of why we feel pain and that can carry over into a lot of things. It's the science of why we feel safe in certain situations versus unsafe. What have we learned to expect of certain situations? Your brain doesn't know all the tiny details around things it knows what it has context for that's really interesting i'm just thinking amount of people i know when they have some sort of pain mm. that will avoid certain things because they, they think it's directly the cause of it and there is a physical pain when from what you've just said if i understand 
it, it could not actually be a physical pain, but the nervous system is just hypersensitive to something, and they may think that just avoiding, so say it's like a knee pain, for example, mm. and it's from an old injury, and there's no longer any damage to the knee, but the nervous system still remembering that knee pain, and you're going to do any sort of movement, they're like, that, no, that's it, I can't do that, my knee is going to explode if I do that, and there's actually no damage going on. That's really hard trying to figure that out for yourself because you so. just want to avoid the thing that causes you pain because that's sure yeah. that's the most natural response. But how would you actually then go about trying to desensitize to that? Education is the biggest thing you can do. Yeah. So your brain's job is to keep you safe at any and all expense. So if what your brain knows is that the last time you did that movement, you broke a bone, well, the next time you do that movement, it's going to go, well, we're not sure about this. It's going to send you that same signal. And if it does it long enough, it's the same as any other kind of thing that you get used to. The brain gets really good at utilising those pathways. And it becomes something that it doesn't necessarily need to even process anymore. It's a natural response to that stimulus. It takes a while to get there. It takes a while to get back out. The best thing you can do is education. But then that runs the risk of you're telling this person who is in pain, very real pain, that there's not necessarily any damage your central nervous system is being too overprotective. It's not that you're saying it's all in your head, but that's how people hear it sometimes. Yeah. So it's a really difficult kind of balancing act between you have to validate what they're feeling because it is validate, valid, but you also have to go, but there is an element of... Because it feels exactly the same as it's real pain. Yeah. Same as your stress response, right? People get different stress responses to different things. You might be anxious in different situations. It doesn't necessarily mean there's danger there. It means that that's your response. And sometimes it's a learned response to a certain situation. Sometimes you're overreacting. And if you tell someone who's super nervous and they're having an anxiety attack, it's all in your head, you're fine. There's no danger here. That's well, not going to get them out of their head. That's not yeah. going to help. That's how their body is responding. I think that's part of the issue is some people do just say that, mm. like, in terms of the anxiety, but also in terms of the pain that we're on about. Because I've been to physios and I'm like, oh, I'm in pain with my ankle. What can I do with it after I broke it? And they're like, no, no, it's healed. It's fine. You're fine to go back to work. Off you go. Live your life. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm still in pain. And you still need support in that situation. There might not necessarily be an injury. There might not necessarily be anything structural going on. But there's still something going on that's causing you pain. And the problem is that a lot of people, even like my own degree, which is relatively recent in terms of people who are practicing in the field, there wasn't a lot on there on pain science. There was a lot on there on injury mechanisms, injury etiology, how long does it take to heal, how does certain tissue heal, the 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 cellular level of it we learned all of that and there was relatively little little on the psychology of healing or on the overprotectiveness of the central nervous system but so many people will get that the number of people if you go out there and look at how many people are suffering from chronic low back pain right there, there might not be an injury to any of them but their learned response is that they have low back pain and oftentimes what they get is this kind of shirk them off yeah no it's fine there's nothing wrong with it or in my case it's it was a you're too young to have low back pain which doesn't help there's, there's no there's no reality where you look at someone and you say there's nothing structural going on you're fine when someone's in pain and that helps yeah. you have to work with them they have to understand why that pain is there without understanding why that pain is there they're never going to get past it because they will always be wondering why is it that I'm feeling pain? And what's our response to something we don't know? Our response to something we don't know is to worry about it, is to fear about it. And the more we worry or fear about something, the less likely we are to get past it. And this is quite often I would see chronic pain turns into a mental health problem mm -hmm. too with that. I, I see it quite a lot in my own coaching practice and a couple of people I know who suffer with um, endometriosis. Yeah. And they've been fobbed off by whoever the health profession is for years told there's nothing wrong with you. Oh, I might be dietary. Um, I actually know a lady who was told it was probably an inflammatory dietary problem for years and she cut like absolutely everything out of her life until they finally diagnosed it with it and then they put a two year waiting list down an operation. Yeah. It's crazy. It's 
I think that it's difficult when you look at it from a health pers- healthcare perspective. Yeah. Because your first port of call in a healthcare system is a general practitioner for most people, and those people are what they say on the tin. They're a general practitioner. They're incredibly knowledgeable at what they do. They deal with a lot of different things, but they're not a specific. They don't deal with specific things. They're not necessarily trained to deal with chronic painful conditions. They're trained to maybe recognise underlying mechanisms but they're not necessarily going to be able to deal with it in the same way that a specialist would. But getting past that first hurdle sometimes, or getting to a point where you're not constantly worrying about why it is that you're in pain long enough to think that, yes, there is something I can do about this to see the right person. That's the biggest step. Because the longer you're in pain, especially, you know, when you talk to people talk to people and they say well this is just how it is now people who've been told oh yeah well you've got no cartilage in your knee and then that's how it will always be and that's how you'll always be in pain and they just think well this is this is it that that i'm never going to not be in pain so they settle but they don't settle and then try and get past it they settle and they fixate on it that's pretty sad yeah (laughs) (laughs) so i think that's a Good point to go on to um, treatment with you. How can people get in touch with you and book treatment with you? So predominantly online, I've got a website, uh, husky-stp.com. I'm on social media, which is husky with an IE dot sports therapy. Um, I do things in clinic and online. Um, I try to post things that are useful. I also do just straight up online consultations where I can tell you what I think is going to help okay and if someone might benefit from someone else's expertise I'll always refer you through sometimes I can't deal with what is what it is that you need dealing with I'm not a specialist in everything and I think that some people will get along better with other therapists yeah and just because you treat both me and Taylor Mm. that doesn't mean you only treat adventure athletes no it doesn't it's a little niche that you're finding yourself in through (laughs) us um thanks to taylor but yeah that's not you that's don't not have to do working. crazy challenges every half year to come and see me no if you do you can come and see me but you don't have to it's not a prerequisite we're you gonna make that to. your thing yeah. though You're gonna yeah. be the unless you've thing, done yeah. something really crazy don't come see me <laughs> <laughs> right um boston's last then our next guest mm. is jack spillett um brilliant snc coach um i probably one of the best ones i've ever met and all around amazing dude what's your question for jack i have a lot of questions <laughs> a lot of questions for for strength and conditioning coaches um do you want me to keep it kind of like adventure athlete based no you no. Just, whatever you want to you you take the rest of the is for everything and everyone okay well i kind of want to know what is his favorite thing what is his favorite sport to program for what his favourite client's programme for is, and why. So favourite sport to programme mm. for, favourite client. Yeah, and why. Why does he enjoy that specific type of programming? And if he doesn't say adventure athletes, Yeah, then exactly, then kick him down, down the stairs. <laughs> and that's it, not getting published. Yeah. He, he'd probably look at me and be like, well, it's definitely not the <laughs> Wasn't the Hammerthon, no? <laughs> Pen around push, he programmed pretty much the whole thing for me. And then Hamathon, it was more like 80% Jack, 20% me. Mm. Or I would kind of use what he gave me and then might build something else based off of it. But he was pretty much the bedrock of... Well, Pen around was entirely Jack programming, yeah. apart from going to see Howell Griffiths for um, my first bout of uh, physio. And some stuff for them, which worked in. But to be honest, and I found that helps quite a lot. Is having the relationship between bringing in the um, the physio and if you work with the coach as well, mm-hmm. especially if they know each other and speak to each other, and you know kind of what to work with as well. So I think that's definitely a good recommendation for anyone who's looking if they've got a coach is to find a physio and work with both for them. Yeah, different specialities. I will never be able to coach quite the same as someone who's specifically an S and C coach because that's not what I focus on. Yeah. But I can work with that person because we both have a good understanding of anatomy. We both have a good understanding of physiology physiology and how you're going to adapt to certain different programming interventions. Yeah, that's us. 
Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Kerry. It's been an absolute pleasure having That's you. That's all right. No worries. It's been nice to hear. You complimented me at the beginning, so I'm going to take that and run with it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And on that note, thanks for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.